Hi, I'm Robert May, Professor Emeritus of History at Purdue University, and I'm delighted uh, to be here today on the invitation of the Civil War Roundtable Congress to talk to you about an aspect of the Civil War you probably have not thought of very much. Um, I would uh, first point out that my talk is based on my recent book, Yuletide in Dixie. And what it argues essentially is that there is a connection between Southern practices of Christmas before the Civil War, particularly uh, in relationship to enslaved people and the downfall of the Confederacy. And that might seem a little bit counterintuitive at first, but uh, bear with me and uh, we'll see if I can convince you of this. So where do we start? Well, the best place to start is to start with pre-Civil War Southern propaganda on behalf of slavery. Before the Civil War, all sorts of white Southerners churned out propaganda to defend slavery. And if you check this propaganda out, you'll find that occasionally a key component was an argument that slaves had it a lot better than Northern white workers or uh, uh, hirelings, as they were sometimes called. People who worked, for instance, in Northern factories and uh, that, that, that part of the reason that slaves had it better was that they were treated magnificently uh, over the Christmas holiday. And um, that gets us to one of the most famous of all the Southern white pro-slavery propagandists before the Civil War, William Grayson. Grayson was a plantation owner in the Beaufort District of South Carolina along the seacoast where they produced a lot of cotton and rice and uh, he owned slaves, and he also was uh, a politician. He served in the South Carolina uh, state legislature, and um, he, uh, he got very upset by, a, uh, uh, by, by Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the most uh, hated uh, anti-slavery uh, writing that came out of the North before the Civil War. And of course, uh, it was a bestseller literally all over the Western world. And it gave a dire portrait of what slavery was like in the South, of, of whippings and family separations and so, so on. And Grayson stewed about Uncle Tom's Cabin for a few years. And he, in 1856, he published an epic poem called The Hireling and the Slave, comparing the Southern slave to uh, Northern white factory workers. And uh, he looked uh, at, at particularly at uh, the Christmas celebration at one point in this epic poem. And we're, we're talking about a very long poem that went for 54 pages. And uh, at any rate, I want you to listen to this uh, with me and then think about just what it's arguing and arguing that Christmas was an important part of what made slavery better than Northern free labor. Uh, and and uh, Grayson writes, around the slaughtered ox, a Christmas prize, the slaves assembling stand with eager eyes, roused with their dogs, the porkers piercing cry or drag its squealing tenant from the sty. With smile and bow, receive their winter dues the strong warm clothing and substantial shoes, blankets adorned with stripes of border red and caps of wool that warm the woollier head. Then clear the barn, the ample area fill. In the gay jig display their vigorous skill. The triple holiday on angel wings with every fleeting hour of pleasure brings. No ennui clouds, no coming cares annoy, nor wants nor sorrows check the Negro's joy. Uh, so uh, you, you think about this poem, and uh, I realize I re read it fairly quickly, but if you were listening closely, you will probably have noticed that this, the enslaved people are getting a, a big hog roast for, for Christmas. There's, there's a, uh, uh, a reference uh, to the, uh, the porker's piercing cry, uh, and there will also uh, be some um, a meat from an ox, and uh, that's mentioned in it. 
And you might mention, might have noticed that they're going to get a Christmas dance. Uh, you're going to clear the barn and so on. There's going to be a jig and uh, the enslaved people will show their skill at the jig by dancing. And then you certainly would have noticed the, uh, the presents that they're getting for Christmas, substantial, decent presents that they welcome uh, and uh, uh, strong, warm clothing, shoes, substantial shoes, blankets that are decorated and so on and so forth. Uh, you might have missed one point in the poem. There's a, a brief reference to a triple holiday, which is an allusion to the fact that supposedly all Southern slaves got many days off for Christmas, in this case three, uh, but uh, many days off for Christmas, not just Christmas Day. And finally, the most important part of the argument, I think, that the slaves are happy uh, and that they receive their presents gladly with, uh, with smile and bow, they receive their winter dues. Uh, they're, they're appreciative, they're humble in getting their uh, presents from their generous masters. So this is the idea and it plays into a stereotype that was very prevalent throughout America before the Civil War. And slaves were happy at Christmas time, celebrated, danced, feasted, and so on. Uh, this illustration appeared in a New York illustrated newspaper in at Christmas time, just a few years before Lincoln's election. And uh, you can see the slaves uh, dancing it up. Uh, white people uh, over here, well-dressed white people who obviously uh, like their slaves, they're down uh, at the quarters watching the dance and so on. Uh, slaves have been given instruments, uh, they're playing the banjo here. There's a lot of uh, talking and assembling and, and so on. It's a good time for all, according to pro-slavery propaganda before the Civil War. Now, Yuletide and Dixie, my book, emphasizes that these stereotypes weren't entirely fabricated. Christmas did occur on many Southern plantations, uh, and there was a lot of intimacy, just like these white folk uh, visiting the, the slave quarters on the plantation. You can see the big house in the distance uh, where they come from. Uh, and uh, uh, this kind of thing did go on on Southern plantations. And uh, there was some intimacy between the owners uh, and their enslaved people. Uh, if you look at Edmund Ruffin's diary, Edmund Ruffin was uh, one of the uh, most famous uh, antebellum uh, secessionists, uh, particularly in Virginia, agricultural reformer who uh, was briefly in politics, but more famous for his writings. And he was a fanatic secessionist. And uh, he uh, uh, supposedly fired the first shot on Fort Sumter when the Civil War started. Uh, but at any rate, if you read his diary, which has been published uh, and you read it for December 26th, the day after Christmas, 1859, you'll see an allusion to the fact that, quote, all sent into the basement to see the shades of the magic lantern. The young children and the Negroes are delighted. And uh, the magic lantern was an early form of a slide projector. And so these were probably just his household servants, but he's taking them down into the basement to enjoy a joint slideshow with his own family. It's a very pleasant picture to think about. Uh, also, we know the very common on Southern plantations especially, but also in other households, was a game they played mostly again with the household servants, but sometimes the field hands were uh, given a part in this game. But the uh, owners uh, played a game called Christmas Gift with the Slaves. And the idea of the game was, that on Christmas morning, whoever spotted the other first, any person on the place spotting someone else first, uh, would scream out Christmas gift and get a present. So you were supposed to hide, spring out from some unexpected place, could be behind a stairwell or uh, from a closet or, or whatever, behind a door, scream Christmas gift, get a present. Uh, although either side could win this game, the emphasis was on letting the slaves win. It was one day the masters went out of their way to demonstrate their generosity, give the slave a small 
victory. Uh, after all, all year long, uh, enslaved people doing heavy labor for you, uh, as well as cleaning your house and, and so on. And um, so give them a victory. And uh, it was played all over the South. Uh, and uh, this is from Elizabeth Pringle's uh, later account, Chickara Wood, about her life on her father's uh, plantation in South Carolina on the P.D. River. Uh, her father had been governor of South Carolina at one point. Anyway, Elizabeth Pringle writes, and she doesn't use the term Christmas gift, which is the most common uh, descriptive of this uh, pastime, uh, but uh, she, she certainly gives an idea of how the game was played. She writes, Christmas morning, very early, Merry Christmas, echoing all over the house. All of the house servants stealing in softly to catch you, and that's in quotes. That is, say the magic words, Merry Christmas before you did. Then joyful sounds, I catch you, and you must produce your gift. Such jolly, gay, laughing visitors, a stream coming all the time. As fast as one party left, another came, always making great plans to walk softly so as to catch you. So that the dressing was a prolonged and difficult matter, for you must respond and open the door when Merry Christmas, I catch you, sounded. Well, uh, at any rate, uh, we know that many slaves had enjoyable Christmas days before the Civil War. Uh, and uh, we don't just depend on white sources for this conclusion. If it were just white slave owners who were enriching themselves off of slaves, uh, leaving their written impressions of the day, we might be very suspicious of it. Uh, but uh, many African Americans either at the time, because they ran away and wrote accounts of enslavement after they got to the North, the, the famous uh, narratives, uh, or uh, the interviews that former slaves did when they were much older in the 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal sent out unemployed writers to interview ex-slaves who were still living uh, and, uh, and so on. And, th and they were published. These interviews have been published in a multi-volume uh, composite uh, autobiography of, of enslaved people. Uh, that's just a, a wonderful source. Over 3,000 uh, slaves gave interviews. Uh, and, and my point simply is that many of these enslaved people, when interviewed, admitted that they got good Christmas uh, experiences from their masters. Uh, this is from uh, Charlie Sandals, and he told one of these interviewers in the 1930s, on Christmas, boy, did we have a time. Yes, sire, master, he would have a big eggnog on Christmas morning. Then we'd give all the slaves some kind of present. Fireworks, candy, nuts, and the best of all was that dinner Christmas day, just anything a man could want to eat. On that day, the slaves was free to go anywhere they wanted or do anything they wanted to do. No, no work on, on Christmas. Well, the most important aspect of these Christmas rituals was the appreciation that the enslaved people showed for the presents they got, for the privileges they got that day, whether it was a barbecue or a dance at the owner's expense or what have you, uh, or the many gifts. Uh, and um, uh, one, of, one of the, you, you can find, accounts of this appreciation in many white descriptions of Christmas in, in, in slave, enslaved times. And um, one of the ones that I came into contact with in doing research for Yuletide and Dixie was uh, the account of John Quitman's daughter, Annie Rosalie. Now, Annie Rosalie kept a diary uh, that I found very valuable. And she wrote in her entry, for Christmas Day in 1858, and I should point out that the Quitmans lived in a mansion called Monmouth, which has become a, a major bed and breakfast in Natchez, Mississippi. It's on the outskirts of Natchez, and uh, many tourists go there. It's been written up in many travel magazines and so on. Uh, and, um, and you can see how luxuriously it was uh, fitted out. It's been restored as, as best the owners could to its uh, antebellum conditions.
And uh, so uh, Annie Rosalie Quitman said that on Christmas morning that year, she gave her slave socks, handkerchiefs, ties, pipes, all sorts of things. But the important thing to me was uh, the pleasure that uh, she wrote, uh, that she expressed in her diary at watching the slaves get their gifts, that they seemed happy. She talked about, quote, the grins and, and bows of the dusky receivers, just as they accepted their gifts. All the servants seemed happy and pleased. As she gave uh, one gift to her black mammy, mammy's and now I'm quoting from her diary again, eyes filled with tears as she wished us a Merry Christmas. Well, I, I think these expressions of appreciation by enslaved people are very telling about how white masters wanted to conceptualize their own keeping of other people in bondage and subjecting them to terrible labor all year long. Uh, they didn't want to think of themselves as evil people, and by getting these expressions of appreciation from their slaves, the masters could delude themselves into thinking that what they were doing was okay. Uh, now, what they did at Christmas wasn't really okay. All you have to do is read Frederick Douglass's autobiography about the Christmas experience. And he concedes <coughs> that slaves uh, partied and so on over Christmas. But what he argued was the master forced slaves to get drunk and that slave drunkenness basically kept down the insurrectionary spirit, that it was, it was uh, like a, um, a, uh, a steam valve, that uh, it released some steam so that a slave anger was mitigated somewhat so they didn't revolt for their freedom. Uh, and uh, with that said, I, th I thought I would uh, read you, uh, and, and well, let me first finish uh, by, by quoting Douglas. He says, from what I know of the effect of these holidays upon the slave, I believe them to be among the most effective means in the hands of the slave owner in keeping down the spirit of insurrection. These holidays serve as safety valves to carry off the rebellious spirit of enslaved humanity. And then I thought I'd just read you one passage from Yuletide and Dixie, in which I try to explain why this is so significant. The flaw with stereotypes about master Christmas paternalism concerns processing the massive documentary evidence that slaves were appreciative for the gifts, feasts, and parties masters provided them over the holidays. To be sure, slaves smiled and bowed timidly in the rituals of accepting their gifts in scenes reenacted in Southern white households every Christmas, year after year. Quote, I am engaged in giving out supplies of meat, sugar, and coffee to the people, Wade Hampton wrote to his wife the day after Christmas in 1853, adding how slaves in turn were dancing and seemed quite happy. I gave out this morning pans, spoons, and fish to all the Negroes here for Christmas presents, all happy and delighted. These were the very behaviors that months and years of enslavement taught Southern Blacks to perform if they hoped to survive slavery physically and psychologically. The smart ones learned to address their masters in the words of Solomon Northup with downcast eyes, to keep their master at ease in the, their presence and accept Christmas payouts that at least temporarily ease their deprivations. Slaves who refused to participate in such rituals invited physical or mental abuse or even seeing their families broken up by sale. Slave Christmas behaviors in many cases amounted to performance art calibrated to the oppressive circumstances of bondage itself. Undoubtedly, many bond people greatly appreciated being feasted and given gifts at Christmas, but this hardly comports with acceptance of their day-to-day -day situation. Receiving gifts and grumpily would have done them no good at all, though sometimes slaves indeed allowed their unhappiness to show, even at Christmas. A low country pla Georgia plantation manager admitted in a holiday letter to his employer that even though he had given the slaves large amounts of sugar or molasses, rum and beef, they danced but very little. In fact, he noted throughout the area that, quote, Negroes made merry but very little over the Christmas 
season. Of course, these same behaviors helped sustain slavery as a labor system, since slaveholders crave feedback that their management methods, though ultimately based on the whip, were nonetheless humane and appreciated by their black workers. And of course, uh, the slave owners wanted to fend off abolitionist attacks, as William Grayson did in Uncle Tom's ca in, uh, in his hireling in the slave uh, poem against Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, by pretending that everything was just wonderful uh, on, on Christmas and all year round, in that, for that matter, on Southern plantations. So with that said, that's your background. Now we get to the Civil War. What are slaveholders going to do when Christmas comes during the Civil War? If you're a slaveholder, because on the one hand, you've self-indoctrinated yourself to believe that holding human beings in bondage is good and that you are kind, and also because you want to project normality, the, the last thing you want to do is have your slaves suspect that the times they are changing. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, so you, do, you try to project normality. And uh, even before the Civil War, paradoxically, on Christmas, the, the day of the year when slaves supposedly were the happiest, there were often slave insurrection panics over the Christmas season because masters uh, had these instincts that perhaps their slaves weren't always happy dis despite their professions that they were doing the right thing. And um, they feared that with their guard down over Christmas because of all the partying that they were doing in the big house, uh, slaves might take advantage and plot a slave insurrection. So even before the Civil War, uh, slaveholders were often uneasy at Christmas time. Now you've got the instability of the Civil War. The Union Army is invading Dixie. So you, you try to carry on just so your slaves won't get the idea that something's amiss. You still give enslaved people passes to visit other places, to visit family and friends on other plantations or in towns or wherever. You still give them days off from labor. You still give them Christmas eggnog on Christmas morning. You give them feasts, presents, and the like. Uh, James Hammond's a good example. At his place, Red Cliff, near Aiken, South Carolina, uh, he tried to keep up Christmas in 1861. And he, of course, owned more than one plantation. And he wrote in his diary, I sent a dozen bottles of my wine to each plantation to add to the enjoyment of the people. And when slaveholders in the antebellum South or during the Civil War used the term their people, they were referring in a very possessive way to the slaves they owned. <coughs> this is from a letter by Reverend C.C. C. Jones who owned slaves and plantations on the South Carolina seacoast. And he writes his son, Charles Jr., on Christmas day of the first year of the war, uh, that the slaves at his Montevideo plantation south of Savannah were enjoying all manner of things pleasing to their eyes and their ears and their tastes from the Christmas stockings that he had given them. Now, the problem is Christmas declension during the Civil War. The longer the Civil War lasted, the harder it was for Southern slave masters to carry on the pretense that everything was normal. After all, there are very few white males around anymore. And that alone would have been enough to put enslaved people on the alert. Gary Gallagher in his book, The Confederate War, estimates that 75% of all, 75% to 85% of all draft age white males in the Confederacy served in some capacity at some time militarily during the Civil War, which is an astounding proportion. How many, how many people today serve in the US Army? Uh, percentage-wise. Just think about that. Uh, Gallagher points out that a minimum of 258,000 Confederates died of battlefield wounds or disease they contracted uh, 
while serving in, in the Confederate military, and that some 200,000 more were wounded but survived the war. Well, the Civil War touched virtually every Confederate household in one way or another. There was a lot of talk of vacant chairs because the white men folks simply weren't around all year round, and certainly that was true at Christmas. And so, although some households, some white households managed to keep uh, Christmas a happy occasion to the end of the war, in many, sadness reigned at Christmas time. Uh, South Carolina Confederate private observed as early as Christmas of 1862. This day one year ago, how many thousand families, gay and joyous, celebrating Merry Christmas, but today are clad in the deepest mourning and memory to some lost and loved member of their circle. It was not easy for white slaveholders to hide their sorrow and depression from the enslaved people around them. It, it was just everywhere. Confederate poet, known as the Poet Laureate, Laureate of the Confederacy, Henry Timrod, wrote in one wartime verse, how could we bear the mirth while some loved reveler of a year ago keeps his mute Christmas now beneath the snow in cold Virginia earth? Household servants especially, because they're around the white people the most, but even enslaved field hands would have been obtuse not to recognize that something was different during the Civil War, something out of the ordinary. They picked up on signals, and there were all sorts of signals. In some areas, Union detachments raided during the Christmas season, even on Christmas Day. Charleston, South Carolina, the which could be argued was the birthplace of the Confederacy. Charleston, South Carolina was bombarded on Christmas Day, 1863. The, the most serious problem in terms of slave management was how do you give your enslaved people their expected Christmas presents in wartime? Your crops might be ruined by the war. Uh, planters were short on funds all over the South, which meant that their income was greatly reduced. Stores were closed or short supplied all over the South because of the Union advances and blockades. And, uh, and, and what was available was highly inflated. Uh, Confederate inflation is a, a common theme in books on the Confederate home front during the Civil War. Uh, on top of that, uh, Union advances turned many, in many slaveholder families into refugees, and sometimes they took their enslaved people with them to go to a safer spot. Maybe they owned more than one plantation. They, they sometimes even went across state, state lines to escape the Union Army. But the, uh, the point is that um, you've got a lot of problems during the Civil War that you're not going to be able to hide from your slaves. Christmas is going to be different. There were bread riots all over the South. Uh, here's a depiction of one in in Mobile, especially in, in southern uh, cities where shops were broken into and, and bread and other items stolen. Uh, so, at any rate, many slaveholders had trouble coming up with decent Christmas presents for their slaves. In the, in the very first Civil War Christmas, John Quitman, you might remember him, he's the Mississippi, he was Mississippi's secession leader and uh, great U.S. hero in the war with Mexico, led the troops into Mexico City, and later was Mexican governor, tried to get Mississippi out of the Union 10 years before the Civil War. But uh, Quitman's eldest daughter, Louisa, writes from Natchez, Mississippi, where that mansion I showed you, Monmouth, was located, to her husband, Joe, uh, fighting in the Army of Virginia. She's the daughter of a very rich Mississippian who owned four or five plantations at any one time. And uh, she writes that she's, Louisa writes, I'm afraid of being, quote, empty handed when the slaves make their usual demand of Christmas gift, miss. So she told her husband in the Confederate Army in Virginia that she had, quote, ransacked the garret and come up with secondhand clothes uh, to give uh, the servants amid the dust and moths of, of the uh, attic. Well, not all slaveholders could come up with anything decent at all. If you read the diary of one Alabama state legislator and cotton farmer, 
Uh, he, uh, she writes in her diary, Windsor, Millie, Edward, Dredd, those, those were all servants, came up. Presents were very scarce as the times were very hard. James Hammond, who you might remember, sent bottles of wine to each one of his plantations in the first Christmas of the war, writes in his diary of 1863 that he's not going to throw any barbecue for his uh, enslaved people that year at all. Uh, he's just giving them a little extra food. Uh, so Christmas is different. Well, all this meant, just as Louisa Quitman had feared that the slaveholders would have to turn down their slaves' demand for Christmas gifts. And uh, you can you consider the case of a Georgia slaveholding mistress during the last Christmas of the war. Her slaves went on strike when they didn't get their usual Christmas shoes. Shoes were one of the most, uh, they still are, but were one of the most crucial items of clothing for enslaved people because of the heavy work they did out in the fields and in clement weather. And they counted on getting decent shoes at Christmas, at least on her place. And she said that uh, uh, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, get that. And I, I, I may have said Georgia, I meant South Carolina. Uh, we're dealing here with uh, Charles Pettigrew, uh, who uh, owned uh, a planta plantations in, in North Carolina, but sent some of his slaves off to a South Carolina plantation, which was managed during his wife uh, during the war. And basically his wife said that the slaves there went on a sit-down strike uh, when they didn't get their shoes. Uh, one one slaveholding mistress uh, said that the slaves came in on Christmas morning during the war, the last Christmas of the war, and they yelled Christmas gift mistress. And she said, all I could do was pull the covers up over my head and cry. Uh, that's, that's, that's the only thing I could do. I had nothing to give them. Uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, perhaps the most famous Black American between Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Booker T. Washington wrote an essay later in his life in which he said that the, the enslaved people on the little farm, he worked uh, near Roanoke, Virginia, that the enslaved people there realized the pinch of hard times, as he put it, during the Civil War, when instead of being given their usual high quality shoes at Christmas, they were given ones with inferior souls that were made out of hickory wood. So that's the story of Christmas during the Civil War, at least on plantations. But is there any significance to the story? Well, I want you to consider the following facts. According, uh, and I, oh, I meant to show you this one too, uh, it shows uh, enslaved people escaping across the Rappahannock River in Virginia in 1862. William Freeling says that about 600,000 enslaved people fled to Union lines during the Civil War. And this equaled about 17% of all Southern slaves, which amounted to more than the entire Confederate army at the end of the Civil War. So you've got a huge number of enslaved people, a large percentage of them male, an adult fleeing to Union lines during the Civil War. Many of these male escapees wind up serving in the Union Army in different units. Now, many of these units were called the Colored Infantry uh, Regiments, uh, and, uh, but there were other units too. And uh, here's, here's one group of them, a company of the 4th Colored Infantry. During the entire war, about 146,000 ex-slaves served in the Union Army. By the time General Grant was putting Petersburg under siege in 1864 and 1865, uh, about one out of every eight soldiers in Grant's army was African-American. Now, many other African-Americans, one time, enslaved people served in the Union Navy. According to U.S. Naval records, uh, in, in 1902, there was a report of 29,511 blacks who served in the Union Navy during the Civil War. 
Now, not only did they serve in the Union Army and Navy, but they often fought with extreme courage, uh, partly from fear of being captured, because as, as we know, sometimes captured slaves, uh, ex-slaves were not only returned to slavery, sometimes they were just mowed down, they were denied quarter, they weren't allowed to surrender. Uh, and uh, we can think about the Battle of the Crater uh, toward the end of the war or the Fort Pillow Massacre. Uh, and um, so African-Americans fought very bravely. At the Battle of Olusti in Florida along the Atlantic, and Gulf Central Railroad in 1864, over 300 of 554 uh, members of the U.S. colored troops who served there died in the battle. Four blacks won the Navy Medal of Honor during the Civil War. At the Battle of Newmarket Heights in Virginia, just this one battle alone, 14 members of the U.S. colored troops won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And at the very least, without these black soldiers and sailors, the war would have dragged on much longer. There's a remote possibility that the North wouldn't have even ended Confederate independence without blacks serving in the military, but certainly the, the war would have extended a lot longer. So then you need to ask why this crucial event occurred, the decision of African-American enslaved people to flee to Union lines. What, what made them flee? Well, the obvious main underlying reason for their flight was the slaves' quest for, for freedom itself, for liberty. It didn't take the Civil War to make enslaved people in the South crave their own freedom. They had been escaping from bondage since the colonial period. Thousands have been doing it for decades. It's why the Fugitive Slave Law was an important uh, element in the North's controversies with the South uh, before the Civil War and is one of the causes of the Civil War. So that's the most important reason. They want freedom. The, the obvious most second important reason why they flee to the Union Army is simple opportunity. The Union Army appears nearby in their neighborhoods perhaps, but certainly nearby. They learn about it, they flee. Think of ben, Union General Benjamin Butler at Fortress Monroe at the beginning of the war uh, when he famously coined the term contraband for enslaved people who fled to his lines. Uh, well, at any rate, those were the two most important factors, but we need to take into account a third factor, the simple breakdown of Christmas normality for African Americans. Now, this normality and its disintegration in many cases had nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, when the Confederate government, for instance, impressed slaves to work on its fortifications, it was taking enslaved people away from the control of their professed owners and um, in a sense, delegitimizing their owners. Someone was more important than their owners. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, ways that slavery got undermined during the Civil War. But partly the disintegration had to do with the crumbling of Christmas customs. It was the one day of the year that many enslaved people could look forward to, or the one uh, brief period that they could look forward to when they didn't have to work, and when they had good times, and they no longer have it. So you might run away on Christmas day itself during the Civil War. Uh, the, the, this is uh, ben, ben Butler back at Fortress Monroe uh, deciding to allow uh, escape people who showed up at his fortress uh, to uh, uh, remain uh, under him instead of returning them to their, the, the uh, slaveholders who claimed them. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, this, this is, is probably the most uh, famous photo of an African-American who was enslaved uh, in, in the entire history of slavery in North America. And the interesting thing to know about it is he, as he ran away after Christmas whipping in 1862. And so after he went to Union lines, there was a whole story of him about him 
in Harper's Weekly on Independence Day of the next year in 1863 and told the story of how he had run away after a Christmas uh, whipping. 43 North Carolina enslaved people did a mass escape to Union held Roanoke Island on Christmas Eve 1863. So sometimes there's a direct connection. But what I would argue is that the change in Christmas customs in the South contributed to the disintegration of slavery itself and the decision of African Americans to run away to Union lines, which in turn helped turn the tide of the Civil War in the Union's favor. And nothing makes my point better than Thomas Wentworth, Wentworth Higginson's Camp Diary that uh, you can find in his book, which has been through many paperback editions called Army Life in a, in a Black Regiment. Uh, Higginson commanded one of the first black units that was raised from former slaves uh, in the South. And uh, what you will get out of this quote, I'm not going to read it because it's in dialect, but if you read it, this is Higginson's words, and you kind of parse the dialect, what you will see is that the, the enslaved people are now in union lines, they're safe and sound, they're having a, a happy Christmas where they're being given a lot to eat, and the previous year they were experiencing enslavement in the Confederacy, and all they got was grits with no salt. Now, they didn't taste very good, those grits. So um, it makes the point that the disintegration of slavery was noticed by the people who escaped to Union lines. I'll give you just one more second. And so that's my talk on behalf of the Civil War Roundtable Congress. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and uh, I'd be interested in hearing from you. Uh, but at any rate, uh, there's some information on your screen about my book and how to get it uh, if you want to do some further reading. I, this talk is focused on the uh, Civil War aspect of the Christmas story, but the book starts with the colonial period and goes up through modern plantation tours.